you have to have some confidence to to stick with your convictions and your beliefs, but you also shouldn't set yourself up for a knockout punch by being too invested in something that might be too heavily levered. And, and so you have to balance your convictions with uh, things that you know can go poorly. All right, everyone. Welcome to the Confident Investor Podcast. Today, I'm here with Kyle Bass. Kyle Bass, please introduce yourself and your investing prowess. <laughs> I'll introduce myself. I'm Kyle. I'm glad to be here with you, Lisa. As uh, someone who paid for his college by by uh, getting a scholarship and in, in diving and uh, you being a gymnast, I feel like at least we have something in common other than investing. <laughs> Um, so tell me just a bit about your career trajectory and how you got into the investing space. Yeah. So look, as undergrad, I was, um, I was good at math and science and I was focused on, uh, becoming a doctor. My mom was somewhat of a hypochondriac and got me interested in all the different potential ailments and, and remedies for those ailments as a child. Um, and you know, of course, Completely overdiagnosed me with many different ailments that I really didn't have. But in, in the end, she, she met well. And, I, and as I got into college, um, I, I, took, I had to take a, uh, a non major elective. I was majoring in chemistry. And, uh, when I took a, an options and futures class, uh, you know, it changed my life. I read the whole book in the first week and, uh, changed my major the next week. So it was one of those moments where I just kind of knew where I wanted to be. Mm. And I mean, that's pretty, pretty lucky. I think a lot of people spend their whole lives not knowing which direction or not having clarity on their purpose. Um, so from there, where did you, where did you take the next steps? Uh, you know, I graduated undergrad and, and went, uh, just literally went to every Wall Street firm I could find. And I came from a, uh, I came from a lower middle class family where my dad was in hotel management. My mom uh, took care of my sister and I. And, um, so my parents never saved anything. They didn't know how to invest. They had never invested. And so it was, uh, it was a new world for me. And, uh, graduating undergrad, uh, again, I, I reached out to all of the sell side firms, you know, the Merrill Lynch's, Morgan Stanley, Prudential. This was May of, call it 1992. And, um, I interviewed with all of them. And, and, and if you knew kind of how stock brokerage firms worked back then, um, typically they'd find someone that had been in the Air Force for 20 years or someone that had been uh, working for PepsiCo for 20 years and wanted to leave, but they had this deep Rolodex of contacts where they could reach out and help manage their 401ks and, you know, become more of a, a call it a, a retail a stockbroker. I, I just wanted any shot of any job on Wall Street and then I could kind of figure out what I do from there. So I, uh, I went through all those processes and, and only one firm, uh, you know, was even willing to take a shot at me. And, um, I'll never forget. He asked me, he said, you know, Kyle, I, you're, you look real promising. We never hired an undergrad right out of school, but you know, why, why should we hire you? And I said, cause if you don't, you're really going to be sorry you didn't. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, they ended up hiring me. My, uh, my salary, he asked me to go through my expenses uh, to figure out what my salary had to be. So I went and got out a spreadsheet and uh, documented my expenses to the T. So my first salary in 1992 was $17,000 a year. And I was, I was damn glad to have it. And when you said that I'm confident that I'll be, you know, the, the best hire and, um, were you really confident at that point, given that you had been rejected from so many different firms, or were you just hoping that someone would take you? No, I think, you know, the, the, the process was almost like a, a fraternal rush where you go through and you meet all the different, the, the way that this office worked, you went through and met all the brokers in the office and you went from, you know, um, uh, from the highest, best, uh, producing broker to the lowest and, you know, after after a few days of those meetings, I I knew I could easily be in the top ten within a year, uh, just just basically uh, spending an hour with each of these people, and I knew top ten percent of that equaled a pretty good living in in, in my life, and uh, so it was a that was pretty that was uh, I don't know it was, a, it was kind of a 
kind of an exercise uh, in, uh, yeah, no, you know how life goes. You've been a competitive gymnast. I've been a competitive diver. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a product of how much work you put into it. And at that point, what was your motivation um, really behind becoming successful? Because I can imagine, you know, you mentioned that it was a, a true passion of yours, but what do you think was the, the driver for you to, to work hard and make it? Yeah, I think in, in some people's lives, it's positive forces that drive them. And in other people's lives, it's negative forces that drive them. And in my life, um, I was always so poor being on a division one scholarship in college. Um, you know, you'd go to school all day, you'd spend three or four hours, um, at, at practice and training. And then there was very little time to have a job. And I always had jobs as well to try to make ends meet. And so for me, it was fear of failure that drove me harder than anyone else. And how would you consider that fear today? Oh, I mean, I think it's it's always the same, right? I mean, you think about how life how life is as fragile as it really is, and given this uh, pandemic depression that the world engaged in earlier this year, and you know now there's this disparity between valuations of public securities and kind of true economic activity that everyone's kind of scratching their head and uh, trying to figure out how to invest around. You know, the title of this this is the confident investor. If anything, you know, uh, if you don't own those five stocks that have gone up as much as they have, then, uh, then you're probably down five or six percent for the year. And, uh, you know, it's, it's always, it's always difficult. And, uh, truthfully, lately I haven't been very good at it. So, uh, you know, I don't know if this is the right podcast for me to be on. Uh, well, tell us what is your approach to investing? Um, you know, I, I just, if you look at throughout time, I started out cutting my teeth being a short seller. And also short seller, special situations, spinoffs, bankruptcies, you know, they, they call that area special situation investing. Uh, but that's where it's really the wild west, even though there's a court system and a rule of law in the United States, bankruptcy law is, is essentially, uh, the wild west. And when you're looking at corporate spinoffs and doing, sorry about that, doing these valuations of, um, these various things, um, about where the spinoff may trade, where, where parent co might trade post spinoff. You know, that was great. That was fun work to be doing. And, uh, I think that, um, that kind of thing is something that I'm, that I'm kind of, you know, very interested in. And, uh, my investing went from there. It, it evolved from special situation investing to more, uh, global event driven situations. And luckily enough, when I launched my own firm in, in 2006, we were focused on, um, the housing crisis in the U.S. And, and mortgage bonds. And then we followed those bad um, private assets to public balance sheets and fortunately enough focused on Europe and the problem with their construct of the euro and, and the ECB and, and how, you know, uh, countries who let their banking systems get too big will be in trouble. And that led us to Japan, that led us to China, that led us to Hong Kong. And uh, everything seems to be event driven. Uh, there's the events, the events take years sometimes to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I know that in 2008, you predicted and bet against the U.S. subprime mortgage crisis and then um, also the debt crisis in Japan and Europe. Um, so how do you go about doing the research for that? Um, you know, even as a as as someone, let's say if there's someone who's interested in doing event based investing and how do they consider starting? First, I would say I think it's a bad idea now. Uh, <laughs> I think I think I think the today's investors uh, will do. You know, you, you follow what what the younger people are doing. You follow what the millennials are doing, and uh, you know, clearly it's it's not value based investing, right? It's more growth based investing. And uh, um, I think if when you're looking at global central banks and uh, what we've seen, the central banks teach politicians throughout, call it the global financial crisis. The European debt crisis, Japan's crisis, and now China's uh, crisis with Hong Kong. I think uh, what, what 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 I come to the conclusion of the central banks will always just print money, right? They'll never allow uh, the small fires to burn and allow uh, you know companies to have this natural process of going bankrupt and and uh, other money coming in to replace it. It's uh, it's basically spare everyone at all costs and um, investing around that kind of uh, central bank policy 
is something that um, I've I've been reluctant to do. But here I am late in my career, and there are a few things that I think um, will kind of be fundamental truths from now on, and that's one of them. Got it. Um, how are you thinking about? the events in 2020, you know, with the pandemic um, and beyond it? Yeah, I mean, look, United States, uh, if you just look at what the U.S. Fed has done, I mean, well, there's $2.8 trillion worth of new bank deposits in the U.S. banking system this year alone, right? Our, our, our central bank balance sheet will expand at least $3.5 trillion, possibly $4 trillion this year. I mean, these numbers are insane. And where we're going to end up is, you know, we say, well, should we be an MMT? Should we follow, you know, the radical left and their, and their kind of desire just to, just to print, forget about deficits. And we've already kind of gone there. If you look at even the Republicans, you know, a short period of time ago, you heard Republicans, you know, uh, being, being a little evangelical about, uh, balanced budgets and, you know, you know, uh, spending within our means. And now you've got, Republicans, you know, going for broke and, you know, we're, we're kind of between a $1 trillion bid and a $3 trillion offer on the next, you know, spending plan. I mean, I, I think everything's been thrown out the window. And unfortunately, uh, it's the central bankers that have caused all this to happen. I believe if you really try to understand the, the basis for the Black Lives Matters protests and, and let's say that the wealth gap inequality, uh, you know, uh, it being being stretched as well as uh, then it turning into physical violence in the streets. That's largely a, um, it's an unfortunate consequence of central bank policy. I yeah. mean, we bail everyone out. Uh, all the rich people stay rich and get richer. All the middle class, uh, all the assets like housing get out of reach to the middle class and the poor stay poor. And so true central bank policy as, it, as it's being used today, uh, I think is just exacerbating that. So what do you think is the solution? Well, I mean, uh, I, I think, uh, unfortunately, we'll never go there, right? The solution is to uh, allow companies like airlines to go bankrupt. I mean, going bankrupt doesn't mean that they're going to stop flying, right? That just means that someone else will own the company. Just like in 2008, we should have allowed more bankruptcies. Do you think we're better off or worse off that Lehman went bankrupt? At least someone believes that it's actually possible for someone that's decided to lever themselves 35 times to go bankrupt. You know, I, I think that's a positive force in the market, not a negative one. Um, but I, I don't know. I think the, the bankers have told us uh, that the pattern is set. and It's only going to get worse. from here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, at what point did you start really gaining confidence in your investing capabilities? Never. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I think that... Uh, you, you and I both know this world is a, a world of trying to get, you know, 55% of what you do right. Um, it's unlike being in school and, and getting 90, 95% of the things you get right. You know, if you were 95% right in the markets, you could quit, you know, while you're as young as you are. Um, but I think that, I think that, um, that confidence only comes every time that I get confident in a, an investment that we're making. It's really a product of the amount of hours you put into it, the amount of calls you make, the amount of books you read, and you really build that confidence. You know, the, the, the least confident positions you have are the ones that, um, you know, you, you should never be in. <laughs> and so what I've tended to do throughout my life, right or wrong, is, is, uh, you know, build bigger positions and, and focus. Yeah. So it's, it's really about, I mean, I feel like it always just comes back to focus right? and really tuning, choosing that lane of excellence, um, and going all in with as much confidence as you can. Um, mm -hmm. to that end, could you share some of your most successful investments or ones that you're most proud of? <laughs> oh, God. Um, you know, it's so funny you asked that. I, I remember all of my bad ones like they were yesterday. Uh, because again, that, 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 that kind of negativity is what drives me. Unfortunately, I'm actually a positive person. Uh, and I love my family and friends and I love being positive every day that I, that I see them. But it's those things that got me are the ones that I don't want to repeat, you know, uh, and, uh, but as far as the good ones are concerned, look, the subprime situation was one of, was one of the, the best ever, you know, um, unfortunately, you know, when you open your firm, 
18 months later, you make several billion dollars for your clients. Um, it's almost like uh, going to the casino and winning the first time, right? It's almost like every other time you go, it's going to be difficult um, to walk out of there. And I think maybe that's a bad analogy, but, um, you know, we did very well early. Uh, and then in Europe, um, we did very well in the beginning of, of the European crisis. And then if you remember Trichet uh, ended up getting with Bernanke and finding the magic trillion dollars for the IMF, even though it was an optical backstop, it actually turned sentiment in that market. And, um, you know, we, we actually lost money in 2009 and we shouldn't have. And so, you know, there are plenty of things that have happened in life that have gone poorly. And let's think about the, the coronavirus. You know, there, there are things, uh, there are things that, uh, if you follow the world, um, we had every time Ebola broke out, I, I read, I don't know if you've read John Barry's book, The Great Influenza. It's one of the best books I've ever read. I read it about eight years ago. And it's about the, the Spanish flu of 1918. And so anytime any of these kind of Ebola or SARS or MERS were to break out, we would track exactly what was happening, how it was spreading. And um, we would actually put insurance positions on, not looking to try to make money. We're looking to insure our portfolio from losses if, the, if it were to spread further. And um, with the with the Wuhan flu, it was the only time we didn't put those hedges on because every time in the last 10 years we put them on, we lost money. <laughs> so, you know, it's, uh, you know what, life is crazy. Investing is hard uh, unless you own, you know, Apple, Tesla, Google and Facebook. Um, you know, which is not my forte, unfortunately. I wish I would have just bought Apple my whole life and it'd been a lot easier. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I want to dig in a bit more into that comment about the, you know, remembering the negatives and having that drive you. Um, what is it about, like, what, what is that chip or that thing, you know, that you think that's really, drives you to remember the the ones that didn't work? Is it a desire to, is it still that fear of failure? Is it something mm. else? Yeah, I think, I think, again, when you start with nothing, the last thing you ever want to do is go back to nothing, right? And so having that, uh, and, and maybe, maybe that's the wrong mindset, right? Because if, if, if you're, if you're a, a cat in a room full of rocking chairs and that's how you act all the time, you'll never, you'll never make money, right? Um, so you have to have some confidence to to stick with your convictions and your beliefs, but you also shouldn't set yourself up for a knockout punch by being too invested in something that might be too heavily levered. And, and so you have to balance your convictions with uh, things that you know can go poorly. Uh, and so I think that that's the way that I think about it. And when things do go poorly, walk me through, let's say, let's think back to a specific incident. Um, what's going on through your mind? What kind of emotions do you feel? Yeah, I mean, early on, you know, it's despair. It's, um, you know, again, early on, meaning early on in your career, when you don't, you, we really don't have any experience. You don't know how bad things can get. You don't know um, what percentage of your investment you can lose. You're not, you're not good at sizing your position yet. And, and those, those can really go poorly and you can lose everything if you're, you know, if you uh, have too levered of a position somewhere or if you're too short something and it's going up so much that it's making you lose sleep at night. All of those particular instances happen, I think, to to a lot of analysts in this world that that um, kind of learn on their own as, as opposed to under a mentor. Uh, right. If you're kind of getting a Ph.D. in life by yourself, um, you're going to learn all those lessons early. And by the way, those, that's the best time to learn them early. Mm -hmm. uh, because the stakes get higher as you get older. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have a mentor? Mm -hmm. No. Oh, I mean, okay. I had plenty of, plenty of people that I admired and looked up to, but I, I didn't study as, as someone's protege or under someone. Yeah. Is there, are there people that you mentor today? It's a good question. Um, I mean, I would say none directly, uh, but I'm, Again, there are plenty of people that I care about that uh, I'm happy to offer advice to when they call me. <laughs> cool. Well, I think one of the things that uh, mentors bring a lot of value in is in sharing their wisdom through the biggest mistakes that they've made and some mm. of their most important lessons. So I'd like to ask you that. Um, what are some of the biggest mistakes and most important lessons you've learned from investments that didn't yield the returns that you wanted? <laughs> 
Oh boy, that that list is long and distinguished. So I have to I have to think about which one we're going to talk about today. But um, look, I would say that um, yeah, I mean, early in my career, one of the first things I did was um, you know found a a fraud in a in a shipping company. If you remember when East Germany when the wall fell, and the East German companies were also listing. Uh, and as, as more of a German company, this, this predates the euro. So it might even predate you. Um, but this is back when things traded in, in Deutschmarks. And, um, you know, we had done a lot of work. I'd done a lot of work around the shipping company and, um, uh, called Bremer Volcan. And it, 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 uh, uh, they were taking the money that was formerly subsidies from the East German government. They were buying yachts and houses and not investing in the business. And it was, it ended up being a full fraud. And, uh, went from 100 marks to 80 marks to 60 to 40 to zero. It never bounced, which is the worst thing that a short can do, right? If it never gives you pain, then you don't learn anything. Um, and so that was that was a positive thing. But then, uh, you know, the next few things that that I ended up focusing on the special sit side also did well. But about four instances in, you know, I found a, uh, I found a company that was um, um, playing with their balance sheet, playing with their income statement. Uh, through uh, creative accounting and um, working with a number of people that I ended up finding on the accounting side and determined that these people were literally uh, making up sales. And it turned out that I found through my diligence and calling, I found their ex-chief operating officer who had left the company a year before. And I tracked him down at his lake house and started to ask him about some of these specific accounting entries. And he said, yeah, you know, uh, it's why I quit. He says, I Something was definitely going wrong. He says, I really couldn't put my finger on it, but I had to just get out of there because I didn't want personal liability. And, you know, when someone tells you that, it kind of validates um, your whole analysis of the company. Anyway, um, we shorted that company and call it $25 a share. And a couple of these uh, newsletter writers wrote it up, wrote up the company in the next few weeks as, um, you know, the next best chip company to Intel. And so it quadrupled. If you're short something and it quadruples, you know, you, you end up losing all of your money. And so, um, that was a, that was an enormous lesson in sizing of short positions early on. Um, and now I'm not sure you should short anything, uh, mm-hmm. because there's so much money out there. But, you know, that was a situation where I had built up, you know, from, 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 from nothing into, you know, close to um, a half million dollars of, of net worth. And back then that was a lot of money. And I ended up losing all, almost all of that uh, in that investment. And so, you know, those lessons that you learn when you're, call it 25 years old, are vital to understanding and, and developing your, your investment philosophy going forward. And so, you know, better to lose it all at 25 than at 50. So you... Right? Do you think it's important to have that experience of losing it all or almost all of it? No, I think I think it's important to to get things wrong early and to have someone that you talk to or explain it to you or some boss that that can help you with kind of talking that through. And I think I don't know how many times, you know, you've had losses and you wake up at night thinking about them. I mean, you know, you, you, your woulda, coulda, shoulda and your. You know, your fact that you invested in something and you didn't do all the work you should have done and lost money, you know, that's cumulative experience over time. Yeah. Yeah. So as you think forward, what industries or investments are you most bullish about? Yeah. So I think I think productive assets, mostly in the U.S. And so whether that is multinational corporations that do most of their business here, some business overseas. Uh, or whether that's uh, real estate like apartments, real estate like uh, Timberland, real estate. Um, you, know, you can even think about oil and gas royalties. I know a lot of these ESG investors would never think about that. But um, I think the significant curtailment of hydrocarbon investing and CapEx um, and this desire to invest around renewable energy uh, is is um, it's definitely admirable. It's definitely the right moral position to take. But I think going forward, we're going to have another uh, pretty severe shortage of hydrocarbons in the next few years because no one's been drilling uh, and no money has been allocated towards uh, keeping these wells going. And so uh, I think there's some great opportunities in productive 
assets. Um, and again, that, that's, that's, that's bringing the, the macro into the micro, right? The macro is we're going to keep printing money. Asset value is going to keep moving higher, whether it's the five stocks and the S and P that go up every day or whether it's real estate prices, uh, in some of the, the areas of the United States. You just think about all the people from New York City are moving to Texas and all the people from California are moving to Texas and Florida and states that are, let's say, properly run from a fiscal perspective. And so that, that phenomenon is only going to continue for the next 10, 15 years. And investing around that phenomenon is going to be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you talk to us a little bit about your private portfolio? You know, are you invested in real estate? Are you invested in any startups? Yeah, so I, I have a few, I have a few startup investments, and as you probably know, the venture capitalists that do this for a living, uh, they have a giant portfolio of startups, many of which they expect to be zeros, and others they expect to be a hundred x, and and they hope that their average uh, is is a multiple of their initial capital. Um, I've done it on on a much more limited scale, um, just with people that I know and trust. And my record is is very spotted. I, I wouldn't say that I'm a great startup investor. I would just say that uh, as I get older, I get better at it because again, I see where where some of the pitfalls are. But I still make huge mistakes there. I only invest in startups if there are people that I've known. For a, for a, for a while, or if they are friends of good friends of mine, and I can understand and trust, you know, their judgment, what they're doing. But I don't spend a lot of my time on that. I really focus um, doing what I'm doing here at, at Human. Mm, got it, got it. So even on um, when within that private portfolio, for you, it's it's all about the people. Yeah, I I I think it is. Definitely, you're always betting on the jockey. You're not. You're not ever betting on that horse. Uh, and if you do bet on the horse, you're going to lose more than more than you more than you thought you were going to lose. And so I, I think betting on those people that are that are really extraordinary and winners. I, I always say I like being long long human ingenuity and short financial ingenuity. Right. That's that's a good position to be on. Yeah. And what are some of the traits that you most admire in business leaders? There's one that's pervasive amongst all of my friends that are successful, and it's I call it their constancy of purpose. You know those people that just never ever let up, and they they know how to they know how to relax and have a good time every now and then. But I mean, these people they get up, they're always organized, they're always focused, they're always working, they're never really goofing around, and um, it's it's hard to explain what that is. But I have a handful of friends that have that. Um, and they're, they're amazing at what they do and they're fun to be around and they're, I learn from all of them. The, I would say the number one character trait that I see in successful people is that constancy of purpose. Great. And what would you say is the most important takeaway, um, that a new investor, um, could have from this conversation or that you'd like to leave them with if they're just thinking about getting involved and putting their money somewhere? Ooh, you know, you're asking at such a strange time in life. And, and I, I, I wouldn't have said that prior to 2020, truthfully. Um, I would say that, um, the game's changed. All of the world's central bankers are now basically enabling the wealth gap to widen. And, um, if you, if you're, if you're going to start reading about, you have to make a determination as how you think the world's going to act going forward. Uh, and you know, what, what, what in history has been able to really narrow wealth gaps? And many of those answers, uh, are written in a book called The Great Leveler by a Stanford anthropologist. You know, you should go read that book. Uh, but if you're going to talk about investing, you know, if you just want to get into, get in front of financial flows, which is what Ray Dalio is so good at, right? He just looks at the plumbing and he tries to get in front of the money flows. Uh, it's kind of what I was talking about with regard to, um, Tectonic shifts in New York City, San Francisco, changing dramatically. You mentioned that you spent the whole coronavirus in Austin. Um, it's a much better place to spend it than New York City. I can promise you that. Um, and so I think you, if you're thinking about starting investing today, picking up Graham and Dodd's book is probably not the best thing you can do uh, because things aren't being valued that way. Things are 
things are being valued in, in completely different metrics and there are different players in the market with the Robinhood investors and the mutual fund investors and this, this concept of almost like morality driven investments and ESG focused. And if you're, if you're buying value, they're going to keep getting more valuable, which is not going to be good for you. Um, if you're buying good growth, growth's going to work. Uh, but there's also the private markets where I think you can do really well investing in those kinds of productive assets that we talked about. I think getting a snapshot of today is a really difficult thing to do. Uh, and, and if I were young, I would take, I would kind of take that census first before I decided uh, what I, where I was going to focus. Got it. So don't leap into any big investments at this moment. Um, kind of bide your time, do your research, read some books, um, see what you're comfortable with. Yeah. Or, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying don't get involved in big investments. I'm just saying that, you know, if, if what you're doing is if buying a valuable, cheap, uh, let's say a Graham and Dodd value, uh, energy stock, uh, but no money is coming in energy. And if they run into trouble, their debt, their, their debt's going to be, uh, you know, impaired and the equity may be worthless. Then those are really precarious investments. But in the past, that kind of value investing worked. And today I'm not so sure. That's going to work across all industries, uh, in today's environment. And yet other companies, you know, like Tesla and others trade at so many giant multiples of sales and hopeful earnings in the, in the future that it, those, those are difficult to value as well, but that's what works. Uh, I think finding some modicum of, of kind of balance between those two is, is where I would be. And, and again, I would, I would spend more, mo- I would spend more time focused on investing in, in uh, private assets that are easier to value that are also uh, going to appreciate as the central banks continue to um, expand their balance sheets. Mm-hmm. Well, I'd be, uh, it, it'd definitely be interesting to see where we are even a year from now, um, mm-hmm. see, how, see how things have changed. Well, this has been a really, really interesting conversation, and it's been great to get your views on um, the landscape and the future uh, where things are going. Uh, two last questions for you. If you weren't an investor, what would you be doing? Hmm. That's a good question. I mean, we're actually in the midst. Of, I'm in the midst of, uh, of thinking about that as we speak. And um, I think there's some really interesting niche opportunities out there, given the macro environment that I've talked to you about. And merging that with the micro of some of these sectors where you might be getting in front of population demographic flows as well as financial flows. And um, that's something that that we're talk- talking about. Maybe a year from now, I'll give you that answer. <laughs> um, and then the last is, what is your favorite part of being an investor? Oh, I mean, I love vindication. I love, in the end, after after... You know, fighting the good fight and investing, uh, investing around the thesis that you've developed over many years of diligence and, and hard work and flights all over the world and meeting with investors all over the world and just ending up delivering a positive return to your investors and being right, uh, is the greatest feeling in the world. And, um, it's something that, you know, you get up every day trying to do. Great. Well, I hope that you have plenty more opportunities to be right in the near future. Thank you so much, Kyle. Yeah, Lisa, it's a pleasure.